Hi, everyone. Hello. How are we all doing today? They can't answer you. Oh, uh, yeah, I, I know. But I thought <laughs> I might ask. Let me fix that a little bit. There we go. All right. Hi, Sophie. Hi, Kevin. Uh, we're just meeting now. We definitely haven't <laughs> been stuck in this apartment together for Woo! Um, over a month now. Great. Love or, that. Or is it a month? I don't know. Love that for us. Either way. Um, real quick, before we get started today, uh, uh, I've seen a couple people asking both in our YouTube chat and the Discord um, if there's like a way to support us for this, and the short answer is don't. Uh, it's really important to us that we keep this free and that we just keep this like a fun, educational, and like community building experience for you all. However, if you want to show support for us, what we're going to start doing is we're going to start uh, repping different um, charities and things like that that you can and causes that you can donate to um, each week uh, to help out. So today, if you check down in the description of the stream, you will see a link to the Emergency Release Fund. Um, which is based in New York City. The whole purpose of it is to uh, post bail for trans people who are currently in the system uh, where the uh, coronavirus is spreading really, really unchecked. Yeah, so super important right now, especially in New York. Yeah, so it's it's so they can get out of there for now. Um, so go check that out. Link is in the description. Um, and we hope you support it. Thanks, yeah. everybody. Thank you. Um, so before we get started, a um, couple of reminders, which are, uh, make sure that you are in the Discord if you're not already. Um, and I think as always, there should be a link to that in the description of this video. So make sure that you're in there. Um, and as we proceed, um, the live channel is the place to participate. Um, so when we ask questions and stuff or ask for feedback or comments, uh, we're going to be asking you to post in the live channel. So not yet, uh, <laughs> but when we get there. And then I think the other piece of business is um, to go over a submission from last week. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah. So if you remember, um, last week, uh, our topic was conflicts that suit the character. Um, so, this submission is from, ooh, I need to check and see who it's from. Um, this submission is from, uh, Latino Robotico. That's uh, a good name. That is a good name. It's and it might be, name. that might be a group effort, I'm not sure. Mm. Um, so, it's very short, so I'm actually going to read the whole thing. So, sit back and relax. Let's do it. I'm ready for story time. All right. Joseph has a lot on his mind. Thoughts swirl and ricochet within his skull, threatening to twist his mind into oblivion. He's always had this issue, this inability to shut off his mind, as people often say. And so at a young age, he turned to the symmetric and logical nature of mathematics. As his thoughts swirled inwards, he could lay them down on paper in the rigid lines of fractals, trapped and still and harmless. There in his journal, his thoughts could threaten him no more. It was all logic in mathematics. You didn't have to think, not really. Just follow rules. It's simple that way. No rabbit holes to follow that could transform into black holes trapping him within the cold chaos of an imploding star. One such fractal did not give him peace of mind, however. The one currently tossed on the ground, peering up into his dorm room from a sheet of lined paper, in fact. This fractal was peculiar. Earlier this morning, Joseph had crafted the fractals. He drank his French-pressed Colombian coffee, sitting at the cramped desk squeezed between the, the wall and his dorm bed. As he prepared to leave for class and glanced at the sheet of paper, he witnessed it move. This fractal he was looking at, it was not the fractal he had created, or was it? It seemed slightly off, perhaps by a few degrees difference, but he was sure it was different. Of course, he didn't see it actually move, but each time he looked away and back to the line sheet of paper, the fractal was of a slightly new design. Joseph hesitantly walked to his desk and lifted the sheet a few inches from his nose. He stared into the fractal, capturing as much of it as he could in his periphery with wide, unblinking eyes. He stood, waiting to capture its movement, to see if it was truly changing to see if what he had come to see as logical and true and consistent, these fractals, were also susceptible to the chaos that twisted and swarmed within his mind, to see if truly 
Nothing could be relied upon as true. A fleck of dust forced him to blink, and he opened his eyes to yet again a possibly new fractal. With horror, Joseph releases the page and briskly walks out of the dorm as the paper gently floats and settles on the ground, where it sits, supposedly still. I really like that. Good job! I like that a lot. Well done! Um, Yeah, I think that's an interesting one because I guess we sort of don't know whether it's kind of a literal monster or a metaphorical monster, and that's that's what's upsetting about it you know he can't he can't trust his own perception Mm -hmm. uh which is a very scary thing uh and a good monster whether it turns out it's all in his head or not um and the way that it's built specifically for this character who like needs to be able to trust in like Mm -hmm. basic realities of how things are and specifically how he operates. And the one thing that he thought he could trust is being taken away from him and twisted. Yes. Good job. Yeah, I like it a lot. submission. A lot of good details in there, too. Like, even uh, French Press Colombian Coffee, maybe just because... Yes, very specific. Yeah, maybe that's because I'm currently uh, jonesing for my next coffee, but (laughs) that really got me. Um, So thank you so much. Latino Robotico was? Yes. Thank you so much, Latino Robotico. And co. Good work. Uh, so, uh, I think we're ready to, to get started, huh? Yeah. All right, today, as we uh, pitched to you all, we are talking about, will this transition work? Yes, we're talking about tips for writing interesting relationships. Oh my God, they were roommates. They were roommates. Uh, because we're very hip. <laughs> yeah, we're cool and young. We're, yeah. <laughs> Uh-oh. I'm not 30 yet. Uh, so, tip, three tips for writing interesting relationships. Uh, this was one that a couple people asked for, um, but I also wanted to lump in some other topics that people had asked about um, under a slightly different heading, uh, which was... Oh, you could move along now, slide. I wouldn't mind. There we go. Uh, the unteachables. <laughs> uh, so, there are some uh, skills in writing that, for various different reasons... Um, I don't necessarily feel comfortable telling you exactly how I go about it. Um, one of the big ones is uh, writing dialogue, right? Um, what I put on there is one very, very simple graph of how to think about how you write your dialogue. It's just I like it. too dependent on style for us to teach a concrete rule. So I could tell you my method, and if you use my method, you might think, oh, I'm awful at writing dialogue, this doesn't work for me. Um, when in reality, if you play to your strengths, you'll be fine. Uh, part of the reason that I would put this under unteachable is because the writer friends that I know all go about this extremely differently. So it, even the idea of telling you how to do it gives me pause, right? I would say on this graph... Pause. Uh, a pause. On this graph of fancy to simple, realistic to heightened or exaggerated, uh, left to my own devices, I'm somewhere up here breaking the barriers of the... Uh, of the chart way up to the top right and Sophie probably brings me down to a reasonable level right around here. Well, but also I would say for you specifically something that you like to do that you have a lot of fun with is um, uh, what's the word for it when it doesn't match when you go right Oh, the right juxtaposition, right. yeah. That's or, not the word I meant. Oh. Um, we have a phrase we refer Register to shift? Yes, register shift. Yeah. Uh, that's something that you like to do a lot and it can be something that one character does, like yeah. hopping from one to the other, or sometimes it's the contrast between the way one character talks and the way another character talks. Yes. So, that, so I mean, like, like I was pointing out, there are a billion other factors in this, too. How comedic is it? How, you know, etc. Um, I also think that's something... So, again, this actually is not something we're going to teach today, but I think it is maybe just something to keep in the back of your mind because I think it will... It will be relevant yeah. as far as uh, character dynamics and stuff like that. Definitely. Um, um, and we're not going to leave you high and dry. Don't worry. Uh, imagine if this whole thing was just like, here's some stuff we won't we teach, teach you. you. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of telling you how to do it, I think that the best thing that, that we can do is tr- is tell you how to train yourself to do it. Um, because, again, your method's probably going to be very different. Uh, my recommendation would be observing your favorite stories. Ask questions like, when is the most interesting to me? When is it the least? And try to reverse engineer it. And observe it in the world around you. If you find someone really interesting to listen to, try to figure out why. Uh, thinking like a writer in that way is something we're going to keep coming back to 
today. Um, and it's something that you will not get right away. You, you need to practice a lot to get there. Yeah. And, like, it is something I think that makes can make you an annoying person. Oh, 100%. <laughs> because you sort of get used to observing people as though they're characters. Yeah. And I think my worst habit is that, like, I'll do that, but then I'll tell them about it. I'm like, oh, you have this habit. You do this thing. <laughs> People don't like that, I think, <laughs> when you tell them about their tics. Yeah, um, both of us are also incapable of watching a movie without just, like, vivisecting it right after. Just yeah. tearing it open. Yeah. And some people don't like that, <laughs> it turns out. They just yeah, want to watch so the movie. So it's just, like, it's a different way of, of thinking about it. It's like a different yeah. part of your brain to turn on and leave on. Um, the, the two broadest tips to getting that mindset that I'd suggest are just stay curious, keep asking questions, and steal, then adapt. If you like how somebody talks, take it. Then figure out how to make it uh, make sense for your character. And, uh, I mean, like, yes, do it. I mean, don't plagiarize. Yeah. But, like, um, I think part of the adaptation comes a little naturally because when you do something yourself, it gets filtered through you. Yes. So it comes out a little bit different. And this is actually... Um, here's another thing we're not going to talk about that I'm going to touch on right now. Uh, but we had questions about stuff like voice acting and yeah. we're not really, probably not going to address that, mm -hmm. um, in this workshop series because this is more about writing. Um, but as it happens, that is actually a lot of how I direct voice actors with that same thing, right? Just take another voice, yeah. you know, like a, a famous actor or a character or something and just do that voice, and when it comes out of your mouth, it will sound a little bit different. Right, right. Um, and and honestly, I think sometimes you write that way, too. Like, you will specifically take a character, but you're not, like, pulling from the movie that they're in. It's, like, this yeah. own context situation, so they have to say something different. Oh, yeah. And you're just stealing that voice, but it comes out differently because it's from you. When we first introduced uh, Buddy mm -hmm. on our show, I watched the same clip with Catherine Hepburn of uh, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner uh, a million times. It might have been a million times. I think that if you go find that clip on YouTube, <laughs> half of the views are me. Uh, uh, and there's two million. And there's Yeah, exactly. Um, but, like, I don't, I don't do that anymore. I don't need to go through the, the Catherine Hepburn, like, uh, transition in order to get to writing Buddy because now she has her own voice in my head. Right. But I had to start with a very distinct voice. In right. And sometimes you can be that literal about it. I mean, yeah. it was Kevin, like, watching that same clip, and it was also me telling the actor, do this like Catherine Hepburn. Yep. You know, so, like, very literal. Uh, but it starts to come out different and develop its own thing. Um, yep. Just because it's somebody else creating it. When we'll, we'll touch later on about how to make sure that you are developing it towards your own thing. But first, another unteachable. Yeah. Like um, life. Yeah, I am very I'm just inspired by myself and my own life. <laughs> I quit. Stuck with me. You are stuck with me. <laughs> God. <laughs> but uh, but like I think especially in terms of writing relationships, mm -hmm. um, I like to think about what I observe either like between myself and people I know or between other people I know interacting with each other. Mm -hmm. Um, so for example, like one type of character dynamic that is very resonant for me is when one character, um, annoys the hell out of another character who hates it, but also kind of loves it. Don't know why that appeals to me, but it does. You may have just gotten a demonstration <laughs> of why that appeals to them. Um, you can do the next. All right. Do you want the mouse so you can click at? Sure. There we go. Um, yeah, so this is obviously something that I experience <laughs> um, a lot. And I think it, like, I just think it's funny. And I think that's a fun place to build from, which means that we just end up um, using that a lot in our writing. Um, so we have a lot of examples of that uh, if you are a listener of the Penumbra, which I imagine most people are. Um, so, for example, Rilla and Aram um, is a good example of that. Oh, Rilla and Aram is also a good example of what we were mentioning about uh, register shift. Right. Or, um, you know, character voices with a mismatch, right? Because if you think of Aram, who has, like, a very heightened way of speaking, uh, mm -hmm. and Rilla, who is one of the most grounded, realistic speakers yeah. on the show. Um, and, and that, like, the thing is, those two things are related, mm -hmm. right? Like... 
the fact that they talk like that has to do with the fact that one of them will be very annoying to the other. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But also they'll love it. Um, Caroline and Angelo is another example. Um, Mick Mercury with anybody. <laughs> um, and there are tons more examples in the show. And it's just that that is a dynamic that is interesting to me. And that I that makes me laugh and happens a lot in my life. And so it's kind of easy to pull from and write down. Mm-hmm. So, um, and I think that is just another example of, like, having your writer bra- brain on, you know. Mm-hmm. So, like, when people have interactions around you, you're not just laughing about it. You're laughing about it and you're going, oh, that's kind of fun. Um, can I layer that on to maybe these couple of characters that I have? Maybe that informs how they're going to interact with each other. Right. Um, so, so similarly, like, steal, then adapt. Stop worrying about being original. Mm-hmm. And start worrying about being authentic. Right? right. Is this a real relationship, even if it's one that we've seen a bunch of times mm-hmm. before? Right? Those are our unteachables. We may have some more in the future, but let's get to the tips that we promised uh, so that we can, can get into the meat of this. The mouse disappeared. <laughs> Here we go. Three tips for writing interesting relationships. Uh, today we're going to talk about resisting the internal editor, uh, finding interesting shortcuts to relationship development, and kickstarting relationships with inherent conflicts. Uh, so we broke this down into three tips because there's a ton that you can say about this, and we wanted to keep this pretty simple. Um, this may be a topic that we touch on again at some point in the future, uh, but these are some of the, the best practices that have really worked for us, I think. Um, let's talk about resisting the internal editor. Um, I want to know, which of these two children are you most interested in? First is Sally. She's a picky eater. She likes ice cream. The second one is Sally. She's a picky eater. She likes ice cream topped with mushrooms and anchovies. Intriguing. Right. Which one are you more interested in? But why? But why? <laughs> what in Sally's life could have happened? Um, I'm definitely much more interested in Sally. Yeah, that's yeah. fair. That's fair. <laughs> Sally's got a lot going on. Uh, so uh, the basic thing that I want to get across here is resist the urge to stay in character. This is another thing that uh, I know that I've heard a lot of my students uh, say that they're worried about. I've heard a lot of you say that you're worried about. Um, in character is a con- concern for revision, not drafting. Often our favorite moments with characters and people in real life are the moments where they do something unexpected. And you should be learning about your characters while you are writing them, right? Um, it seems a little bit out of character if we go back to uh, Sally for a sec. It seems a little bit out of character for someone who is a picky eater to like ice cream topped with mushrooms and anchovies, right? That lends further questions about, like, is this all that Sally eats? How did Sally get here, right? Uh, it seems on its face like a contradiction. But in the process, we learn more about the situation and Sally becomes more of an individual, right? Um, to give you an example of this uh, from my life, uh, I'm going to talk about my grandfather for a second. Uh, I've got to I got to give the caveat here that uh, I I don't remember my grandfather terribly well. Unfortunately, he he passed away when I was quite young. Um, so all of my memories are through the filter of me being very very small and afraid of this man. Uh, but I remember uh, I remember a lot of whiskey. I remember he smelled like smoke. I don't know if it was cigarette or cigar smoke. And I remember uh, him being very, very angry sometimes. Never with me, but I do remember some shouting matches that my grandfather had. Uh, this all paints an image that we think we know, right? We think we know this person. Um, so the last fact I'm going to tell you about my grandfather might throw you for a loop, uh, and it's that he was obsessed with chihuahuas. Absolutely 100% <laughs> obsessed with these tiny, tiny dogs. Um, I, I've heard a story, I don't know if it's true, it would have been before I was born, but I like it, so I'm going to tell it anyway, that um, when he and my grandmother lived in France, he had a bad habit of just stealing dogs off the street and saying, like, I found this, can we keep it? <laughs> just like, um, I don't think so, sir. So he, again, it seems a little bit out of character that this like very gruff man would love this tiny adorable dog, but that's part of the reason why he is, uh, why he still sticks in my mind as such a complete person, as a person, even though I didn't know him for very long, right? Um, so that's turning off the internal editor, right? D- don't worry about getting out of character. Worry about learning about the character. Let them surprise you because none of us are completely consistent either, right? We all act out of character all the time. Um, So use that to kind of develop what you know about the character. And I think um, 
perhaps more specifically in the context of this workshop, a lot of times we act in a way that's out of character when it is um, in relation to a- another person. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes another person will cause us to behave in a way that we might not even expect. Yeah. Um, which is, I think, where that becomes relevant to like relationship dynamics. Mm-hmm. Um, our second tip was find interesting shortcuts. You want to talk about this one, Sophie? <sighs> shortcuts. Yes, I love shortcuts. Um, okay, so why do we need shortcuts? What do I even mean by shortcuts? Um, so this is a really interesting thing to me because um, like, we talk a lot in fiction about relationships that are realistic, um, that are grounded, that make sense, um, you know, that like, a, a, I think particularly when we talk about romantic relationships, although not exclusively, like we want them to develop in a way that we can believe. Um, I also think I won't get into it too much, uh, because that could be its whole own topic, but I, I think there is a little, like, people will approach this with a little bit of, like, a, a moral or Mm. ethical viewpoint on this, you know, Mm -hmm. like, you should not portray characters in this type of relationship, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I don't think we really have time to get into that, uh, but I do think it's interesting. Um... So sometimes that is a concern people have as well. But anyway, uh, if you look at this graph, <laughs> this is very funny. Oh, thanks. Yeah, nicely done. <laughs> um, but if you look at this graph, uh, you'll notice that uh, the length of life is a lot longer than the length of your story. And it is true that some stories do encompass the whole length of a person's life, or even longer. Um, although I would say typically they do not. Right. And even then, if it encompasses their entire life, yeah, it does not take very a sped up, life. right? Yeah, um, it's not like a one-to-one ratio. Mm-hmm. So that means that we have to find shortcuts, um, especially depending on the kind of story we're telling and the medium that we're using. Um, in our case, uh, we are doing like half an hour to forty-five minute long episodes, mm-hmm. um, and they're not exclusively about relationships. There's a lot of other stuff going on, so that cuts down on the amount of time we can take developing a relationship even more. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think, first of all, you kind of need to let go of this idea, whether it be artistic or sort of moral, that you need to develop relationships in the same optimal, healthy, long-term way that you would in real life. It will be very boring <laughs> if you do that. Yeah. Uh, so you have to find shortcuts. And we're actually pretty used to shortcuts. We're accustomed to seeing them in stories. Um the example I want to use today is one that I'm very fond of and that I'm guessing people are familiar with, which is Beauty and the Beast. We'll use specifically the Disney adaptation because I'm guessing most people have seen it. Mm-hmm. Um, definitely a big favorite of mine. Here, I mean, here again, we could open up the moral question, you know, because a lot I... Of people do. Yeah, because a lot of people have a huge issue with this movie because they're like, well, this is Stockholm Syndrome, which... I don't think it is. Mm-hmm. Uh, but but also, I think that part of what's going on is that it's not realistic because they're using a lot of shortcuts in this movie to get us from point A, which is Belle hates the beast for very good reasons, um, to get to the end, which is Belle the beast are in love. Um, and would that be great if it happened in real life? Like, no, that, that's <laughs> Fine. Right. You know, it would like, also not be. It's fine. It would also not be great if someone really turned into a giant wolf cow bear man. Yeah, it would. It would. It'd be uh, problematic. Yeah. <laughs> um. So so I don't know. Like I, clearly, I keep coming back to the moral thing because it sticks with me. But like I do, I want to. Al- I want to release you from this feeling that like <gasps> this relationship, like if it happened exactly like this in real life, like that would be unhealthy. Like it's kind of okay. Mm-hmm. So let's talk about some shortcuts that kind of allow us to develop a relationship faster because there's a few examples of that in this movie. So um, the reason that Kevin and I have spent so much time tearing apart this particular movie yes. is because we used it as like the blueprint for mm-hmm. one of our episodes. Um, if you have listened to it, um, it is... Uh, from the second Citadel series, it's the Moonlit Hermit. And we just used Beauty and the Beast as a template 
um, for our story, which is again what we're talking about: steal and then adapt. I mean, we we just took it. <laughs> we just took it. We re- we <laughs> we really did. We just took it straight up. Um, which possibly, if it is interesting to you, you might then want to like listen to that episode and mm-hmm. see if you can fit it together with the story. Um, but we have our own characters, our own universe, and our own voice, and so it's not plagiarizing. It's a whole different story, even though we took that um, structure. So we had this problem, which is uh, in our story, we had a monster had kidnapped a human, and we knew that by the end of this story, we needed them somehow to be in love. Right. So there's a lot of issues there. Um, First of all, how do you get people from kidnapping to being in love? Um, And also, it it didn't take place over a very long uh, span of time. Right. In Um, real life, is it possible? Should it be possible? Uh, Probably not. Right, no, like how long is she there? I don't recall. A couple weeks, maybe? She's there for a couple weeks. And you you don't fall in love with somebody else over the course of a couple weeks in real life, but that's okay, because this is fiction. (laughs) So we went back to our template, which was Beauty and the Beast, and we were like, how do they do it in Beauty and the Beast? Because it works, right? It Mm -hmm. works in Beauty and the Beast. We buy it. We get from the beginning to the end, and we do believe that they're in love by the end of it. So we had to figure out what were the turning points that worked in that movie. So the first big turning point that we realized, which was interesting that it was so major because it's not a plot point that you necessarily think about when you think about this movie. Right. Neither of us remember this scene. And in fact, that's something that we're going to keep coming back to as we talk about this is that there are a lot of scenes that aren't iconic, but do really important background work to set you up so that you care about the iconic stuff. So actually this was pivotal, (laughs) this particular scene. Like it does a lot of heavy lifting. Because uh, where we are so far is that, right, Belle has been kidnapped by the Beast and she decides to escape. Um, And so she runs away in the middle of the night and she gets attacked by wolves. And uh, just when it seems that all is lost, the Beast shows up to save her. Um, And that is the turning point for their relationship. That's how they get from... uh, the kidnapper and the victim to two people who might be falling in love. Mm -hmm. And it's because he saves her there. And so, you know, we've learned something new about him that we didn't expect. She sees him in a totally different light. Um, And And it goes both ways because when the beast is injured during that fight Mm -hmm. in the next scene, we see that. Yeah. Belle has brought him back to the castle and is taken care of. Right. I would also argue that this scene is why, it's not Stockholm Syndrome, mm. is because this is the pivotal scene, and it's not about, like, something that he did for her while he right. was keeping her prisoner. It's just that he saved her life. Right. And this is actually, I think the Beast tells Belle she can go. Yeah. That's, that's when she bumps into the wolves. Yeah. So. Um, so, oh, you're right. It's not just that she escapes. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, we took that. We 100% stole <laughs> We just took it and put it into our story. Um, which, again, if you have listened to the episode, and I guess if you haven't and you're planning to, earmuffs while I tell you what happens. But at the end of the first part of Moonlit Hermit, uh, Rilla is trying to escape, and she creates accidentally um, this monster, Mm -hmm. uh, which almost kills her, and then Aram saves her life. Um, And that's our turning point at the end of part one. Mm -hmm. So we just took it. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, And then uh, here's another shortcut, (laughs) which is the snowball scene, the snowball fight, Um, which I think it is a shortcut actually for two reasons, uh, both of which we used in ours. Um, And one one thing is just the snowball fight itself. Mm -hmm. Um, It's this like lovely playful scene where they're just having a good time and laughing and learning about each other. Um, and uh, it they, they see each other in a completely different light. Mm-hmm. So that stands in. And I think there is like, there's also kind of a montage, uh, which is itself a type of shortcut that you can use, just like jumping through time. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we see a few different things, right? We see the snowball fight and we see um, him learning to like eat... Uh, the right. porridge or whatever, like a little bit more gracefully, but also they compromise because she learns to eat it the way that he does. They go to the library, all that stuff. So there's a montage, um, and it, it it probably only takes 
that might all take place over the course of one or two days, I think. Right. We, uh, I think the seasons change during it. Don't oh, really? They? Maybe. I don't, I don't recall. Whatever. It's not long enough for two people to genuinely fall in love. Right. But we kind of buy it because we like get these different snippets of mm-hmm. um, their relationship developing. And another really big part of why we buy their relationship developing is they sing a song. <laughs> and I actually think this is huge. Um, and obviously this will not work in every medium. It happened to work in ours. Uh, but I think it is a pretty widely accepted, uh, fictional trope that we buy it. If two people sing a song together, by the end of that song, we can be like, yeah, all right, they're in love. Mm -hmm. Or they could be in love. Uh, because it just does a lot of emotional heavy lifting for you. Right. Um, so I'm not saying that, like, that's going to solve all your problems is to put a song in. Uh, but it is, but I'm just saying that a song is a type of shortcut um, that can be used in fiction to speed things up and get you from point A to point B in a span of time that's way faster than what it would be right. in real life. Like, that song can stand in for a year of dating and having important conversations, right. which is what you do in real life. Um, and so once again... We just took it um, Mm -hmm. and put that in that episode. And I was like very hell bent on this. And I, yeah, it uh, annoyed the hell out of you. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) Maybe someday we'll talk about (laughs) writing with a partner and uh, (laughs) I'll tell you all to start running now. (laughs) But Um, but they were right. They're always, they're always right. That's the worst part. Um, do you want to talk more about it? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, I, it became challenging because then you had to write in a direction that would get us to a point where they could sing a song. Uh, but that, that's what that song is for in that episode is um, to get them from point A to point B, to get them to a point where... Or also to get the audience mm-hmm. to point B, to believe, oh, these two people, I believe that they could see each other in this new way. Mm-hmm. Um, so those are... A, couple of types of shortcuts that you can use right so it Um, sounds like the process you're describing is uh replace a lot of duller small experiences with larger more symbolic experiences mm -hmm. i mean especially this does depend heavily on the type of thing that you're writing um and for us we need to use a lot of shortcuts um in part because what we write is so Mm action-packed uh so if there's going to be any kind of relationship development at all it has to happen very fast um if you are writing something really slow really realistic really grounded maybe you don't need to use shortcuts as much yeah um but like the more time you're covering, the more stuff that's happening, the more you're going to find you you want to look out for these and how you can use them. And it is totally valid to like look at your favorite piece of fiction and say, wait, how did they do that? And then structurally just take that and use it for your thing. We do it all the time. Right. You steal, then adapt, right? Love that. And when you make it yours, you it's, it's not stealing anymore, right? Uh, one thing that we're going to talk about... Uh, throughout this series of however long these are, uh, is that process. How do you steal and adapt, right? Our third rule was kickstart relationships with inherent conflict. We're back to conflict. And that's because if we're talking about the purpose of different structures within a story, really the one of the biggest purposes of conflict is just that it, it catches our interest. We, we care about the development of the conflict, kind of inherently, right? Um, so, uh, an example that we have on our show and that I want to talk outside of it is even just the pitch for, uh, this is a spoiler for episode one, but I, I get, I gotta talk about it. Even, (laughs) even, uh, the pitch for the romantic relationship between, uh, Juno and Nereev, uh, is you can already feel the conflict in it, right? A master thief and a private eye fall in love. That's it. You know that they've got to be at each other's throats. You know that they don't want to be. You have the conflict baked into the relationship, mm-hmm. which means that you have a starting point and you have starting momentum, right? You immediately know what needs to happen in order to develop both the conflict and the relationship. The options are available to you. Um, for example, outside our show, uh, I want to talk about Star Wars real quick. Uh, quick spoiler alert for a 40-year-old movie you already know the twist to. I know at least somebody who's watching this who hasn't seen it. Yeah, but <laughs> imagine she has to know the relationship between these two. Um, uh, so uh, if you haven't seen Star Wars, j- pause this, go watch it, come back. Uh, it'll be worth your time, that seven-hour break in the middle. Um, 
the relationship we're looking at here, the conflict is we have a father and son on opposite sides of a war, right? If you're going to break it down. The, another relationship of closeness that the conflict is insisting that they be apart, right? Oh my god, that picture is right before he says, it's impossible! <laughs> I <know. laughs> um, so I broke this into acts, but in the Star Wars series, this is actually broken down really cleanly into the three, the three first made episodes of the series. Um, this is another moment that you may have completely forgotten. At the very beginning, uh, Luke is told that Darth Vader, who works for the Empire, killed his father. Obi-Wan tells him that. It just lies right to his goofy little face. <laughs> um, so the pursuit of Vader is also relationship development for Luke and his dad. Uh, attempting to uh, address this central conflict, right? There is a conflict with the Empire. Uh, is also pursuing Vader, kind of telling us about uh, Luke's relationship with his father that, he never, that he's never met. What his father means to him, I guess. Um, then we have the big reveal that this is a picture of. Spoiler alert, Darth Vader tells Luke he is his father. Uh, and then Luke's further conflicts in the war develop his relationship with Vader. This is when we know what's going on. They are a father and a son on opposite sides of the war. Luke's entire arc after this is figuring out what am I supposed to do about my dad, right? Um, the other reason this is really useful is we've talked over the last couple weeks about how we don't necessarily care about big stakes conflicts, right? When Star Wars starts, we don't care about the Empire and the Rebellion at all. I watched Star Wars many, many times as a child, and it took me until I was, like, 15 to finally get, like, oh, now I understand why there's a rebellion in an empire. I just didn't get it. Right. But I didn't need to, because this personal relationship was really the engine driving that conflict, mm -hmm. right? Um, it's made smaller and more personal. Um, then in the third movie, Darth Vader kills the big bad and is redeemed. Luke's relationship with his father reaches a satisfying end at the same moment as the war ends. The act that brings Luke's relationship with his father to the satisfying close is also the act that ends the war. It's really, really tightly put together. Um, Star Wars is another example, like Beauty and the Beast, where they're telling stories in very broad strokes. So if your style is a little bit more grounded, more realistic, um, you probably won't be using uh, examples this this broad and like uh, and explosive. Um, but I think teaching this with the super broad examples lets you see it, so then you can adapt it to what you have. Um, yeah, and I think that like. I mean, we talked about uh, before, like, being character first or plot first. And I think that, like, you very much in a drafting stage can go back and forth yeah. between. And I think that in developing relationships, this is where that can become really clear, you know, because you can decide that you want to push a relationship in a certain direction, which will then push the plot in a certain direction. And then I think, as we mentioned, um, you can kind of go back in and fill in some gaps as far as the character to justify the direction that that has gotten. Um, so, yeah, because I wanted to talk about, um, like, our relationship arc in season one, mm -hmm. which I that's kind of how that came to be a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, so, once again, if you haven't listened to season one of the Penumbra earmuffs for a moment, mm -hmm. um, but, you know, like... A few episodes into writing that and when we were trying to figure out where it was going to go from here, right, we already had this uh, romantic tension established between Juno and Nureyev and we were like figuring out where it's going to go from there. And we knew that he that Nureyev was going to come back within that season after the first couple of episodes. Um, and we were like, okay, where does this all wind up? And it felt like the obvious place it was going uh, given these two characters and these two character types, the the private eye and the master thief, are that the thief is just going to disappear again. You mm -hmm. know, we know he does this. And uh, that you would just sort of assume that if they do get together, he could just walk out on Juno by the end of the season. Um, particularly because it was sort of already decided that it wasn't just going to be all happy and nice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm generally against things being all happy and nice, uh, in part because it's usually boring. Mm. Mm -hmm. You know, like it's it's very hard to have things be all settled and lovely um, and just like cuddle times and still be a compelling story. Um, mm -hmm. And if it is, it's because something else went wrong, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so 
you know, I love the drama. So I was like, well, something bad's going to happen at the end of all this. And it seemed like the obvious thing to do was to have Nureyev walk out. But um, you can get a long way on just being contrary, mm-hmm. actually. And this has worked, I think, multiple times for us. Uh, in that case, I was like, no, what about instead of that, if Juno's the one who walks out, that would be a lot more interesting because that's not really what we're expecting. Mm-hmm. Um but we were only like halfway through writing through writing the season at this point, which meant that uh, we had time to like back that up, mm-hmm. you know, to justify that in the characters. So like, it seems uh, initially given those two characters, not necessarily out of character, but not what you would expect for Juno to be the one who does that. Mm-hmm. Um, so then we kind of needed to prop that up, um, and it became about how he doesn't love himself (laughs) and he's not ready and he's justifying everything through his connection to his city. Um, And then we got the chance to like go back into Nureyev's background and how he's spent his life always disappearing. uh, But maybe now he's ready to not disappear. Right. So I think that the process that you're describing, right, is the contrariness brings you to uh, an idea that you wouldn't otherwise hit. Mm -hmm. And then it's a matter of, supporting it right Mm -hmm. this is also another version of a previous uh tip that we talked about which was letting your characters act out of character right it's weird where we are in the series now to think of that first action uh at at the end of season one as being juno acting out of character but before we planned it it wasn't in his character right we needed to start once we figured that out we needed to start putting in the little seeds and clues and then kind of also plan our second season Mm -hmm. right so like I mean, it's kind of an interesting thing, and I, I hope that if, and maybe if there was interest in a, um, uh, in another workshop, we can talk about writing episodes of something, or, or writing like a serial, mm-hmm. uh, which is a very interesting thing, uh, yeah. right? We're not releasing to you one whole thing. It's like, we've released a lot, and then we have a lot that's unplanned, uh, which means that for us, it's kind of um, like we had already released the first half of the season that already existed. Um, but we were in a way still drafting mm-hmm. the characters. So that's us still in the drafting stage, still saying, Oh, what if we do this later? How can we uh, back that up earlier in the season? Yeah. Um, yeah. But I think that's enough of us talking for a little bit. So it's time for some practice, specifically for that third rule uh, about create or not rule tip, I should say uh, about creating a ca- uh, Uh, character relationships with inherent conflict. Uh, This practice exercise we're going to do is also something that I will encourage you to do with your group uh, over the course of the next week. So hopefully it's, it's pretty fun. Um, I, one thing that I have always found really useful for writing exercises is randomness, allowing uh, randomness to bring you a challenge that you might not have expected. Um, So today, let me make sure that's coming up on the stream. All right. Yes, it is. Uh, I've put together this exercise. Uh, first, choose what relationship your two characters have. I have a bunch of different kinds of relationships you can have. Roommates. Roommates. They were roommates. Uh, and then uh, next, choose a starting conflict that separates the two. Uh, and here I have a bunch of starting conflicts that will be kind of interesting put next to a lot of these relationships. Um, so what I'd like us to do is I'm going to uh, pick two random numbers. Let me go to a random number generator. <laughs> I'm going to pick two random numbers between 1 and 10. Random.org. There we go. All right. We're going to choose one between 1 and 10. And this will be the kind of relationship we're writing about. Number nine. That is best friends since childhood. Cute. Best friends since childhood. Let's get another random number. Number four. So we're talking about best friends since childhood, and one kidnaps the other. <laughs> that is wonderful. Okay. So, what I'd like you to do, and if you're uh, if you're on a chat with your group right now, you can do it. You can also do it solo for now. That's fine. Um, is either write a dialogue between these two characters or an outline of how the relationship might develop. Try to tie moments of relationship development with moments of conflict development. And remember, relationship development doesn't necessarily mean development in a good direction. It just means that something about their relationship has progressed and changed. So again, we have two best friends since childhood, 
who uh, one has kidnapped the other. <laughs> we want to watch the relationship develop while the conflict develops. Uh, so any ideas that you have, you can put snippets of dialogue, you can put a brief uh, outline or pitch or something like that uh, in the live channel on our Discord, uh, and then we'll take a look at some that we really like for this prompt. Okay? Love that. Um, while they do that, yeah. so should we talk about what we would do for yes. this one? Okay. Let's. <laughs> so, best friends to childhood, yeah. one kidnaps the other. Yep. Um, do you have any, like, immediate impulses? Um... Well, can we... We need character names. We need character names? Yeah. Uh, uh, Dan and... Remember when you wrote a short story about two best friends who were both named Dan? Yeah, we can't do that right now. <laughs> That'd be pretty confusing. Yeah. <laughs> Dan and... Penelope. Love that. Love that. Dan right. and Penelope. Okay, um, naturally, Penelope can not stand. Yeah, uh, obviously, right? Uh, <laughs> and to kind of talk that out, that's a process of being, like, a contrary from what our culture would expect or dictate. Right. And then we realize, oh, that's more interesting. Right. Right? Um, I mean, you have to be careful with that. Like, that's definitely always our impulse, I think. Um, and sometimes that itself gets old. Like, if you do something, if you play opposite day for too long, it becomes right. expected for you. So you do have to watch out for that. Uh, Self-awareness is everything. So Penelope kidnapped Dan. Penelope kidnaps Dan. Um, they've been best friends since childhood. Yeah, but how old are they now? Um, they're, oh, they're in their early 40s. Oh, okay. Have yeah. they, and they've been friends this whole time? I think that maybe they fell out of touch for a while. Okay, and they don't live near each other anymore. Yeah. Um, and Penelope shows up in the middle of the night. In the middle of the night, kidnaps Dan. Kidnaps Dan. Like, threatens Dan and Dan's family, which Dan does not appreciate. Oh my gosh. I know. This is really... We gotta start. We gotta start them off at like a real disadvantage uh -huh. so that we can pull. This yep, 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 yep. Right. So Penelope kidnaps Dan. Why'd she do it? Uh, had to be something really urgent and yep. really high stakes. Mm -hmm. Um, and maybe her family is in danger. Maybe her family's in danger. Yeah. Oh, that's true. Um, maybe it's related to something that happened when they were kids. Uh huh. Yeah. Otherwise, how are we gonna tie yeah. this all exactly in together? Yeah. Right. So. Um, this is they used like, to yeah. they used to live next door to each other. Mm -hmm. uh, there is something. It's like something in the land. Like there's something buried. There's yeah, ancient curse. Okay, ancient curse. Now we're just writing it, which I'm <laughs> very very okay with. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, so it turns out that, and so we have big reveal moments where, you know, uh, Dan learns more of the truth. There should be a reason why Penelope can't just tell him all the truth to start, or maybe a reason why he doesn't believe her. Mm -hmm. Um, so that in the moments of believing her, yeah. that progresses the plot and also progresses their relationship, mm -hmm. right? Uh, they played a lot of, like, fantasy games when they were kids. Oh, I like that. Yeah. And then, of course, they're going to need to play another one as adults. Oh, my God! <laughs> there we go. Uh, let's take a look. We have a bunch of answers in the chat. Um, <laughs> you, got, you didn't have to take our names. But <laughs> that's that's all right. That was just our thing. But that's Names fine. are hard to come up with, as yes. I just demonstrated. <laughs> Um... Oh. Oh, I like that a That's lot. That's sweet. Okay, so Nureyev is my hero. Says, Eileen and Maggie have been best friends since childhood and are 16 now. Maggie's parents are planning on sending her to a summer conversion camp against her will, so Eileen kidnaps Maggie by convincing her to run away and go on their own adventure. They don't have much money, but are trying to figure out how to make their own lives together. I love that. Mm -hmm. um, and I love that you sort of took kidnaps lightly or yeah. your own interpretation, because great, like it still produced a story. Yeah, absolutely. Matter. That's awesome. Right, it gave you a start, like a hook to yeah. then work off of. That's very cool. Um, they are faking a kidnapping to get a ransom from the kidnappee's rich parents. I like that. That's cool. Uh, <laughs> you all are very wholesome. Uh, 
Uh, one character. Okay, this is Redbird said. Oh no, I didn't say who the previous person was. I'm sorry. Uh, that was that was Pluto. Um, this one is uh, Redbird seven one nine. One character has become a peon of the oppressive government. The kidnapper is a radical who rescues them. Dan is the peon. Penelope is the kidnapper. Dan has exactly zero idea that Penelope is a cell leader. Oh, I like that. We have mystery baked in there too. That's right? really cool. And another opportunity to develop the relationship during big moments in this, like, big rebel uh, rebel government plot. Right? Oh, this one's pretty cool. Uh, from Sun. Two best friends drift apart as they graduate high school and go their separate ways. One, in a bid to try and pay their student loans, they're behind on their payments, kidnaps the other, more well-off one, to ransom them for money. Whew! However, over the course of the period of time they spend together, they kindle their love for each other. That's I like fun. This. I like that a lot. Yeah, that's very good. And one of the great things that I'm seeing from a lot of these is that you're starting these relationships at a disadvantage, um, <clears throat> which is good. That gives you something that immediately, if you get the audience invested in these two characters, they are going to feel like, oh, I want it to work out, but I don't see how it can, right? And then your job is to figure out how to make it work out. Um, let's do one more of these, and then we'll go to questions. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see. Our first number today is... Eight. Let's take a look at eight. Eight is neighbors. We have two neighbors. And then we, already, we just did four. Let's do another. One. Two neighbors on opposite sides of a war. Oh, that's cool. That's wonderful. I really, really like that. Um, okay, so again, uh, snippets of dialogue, uh, broad uh, concepts, summaries of, of what the relationship would be like. Um, and while you all make those, Sophie and I will we'll talk out how we would do it. Yeah. So again, you don't need to take, you know, the names or ideas that we're starting with unless you feel like it. Um, we're just going to come up with our own while you do the same. Right. So I feel like it must have been a good neighbor relationship to start. Mm -hmm. So that this can, like, cause a rift between mm -hmm. them. Um, I mean, I, like, what I am imagining, like, is that... It is, like, uh, sectioned off physically. Mm -hmm. uh, like, it's this side, this side against this side, and yeah. each of them just lives just barely on one side or the other of the dividing line. Nice, nice. Um, which I feel like makes it kind of sad. Yeah, so kind <laughs> of a... But maybe it wasn't always that way. Yeah. Right? Like a civil war Yeah, there's started. been, like, a divide, and it's just they happen to, to live one on each side. Right. Um, let's get two names for these. You made me do it last time. Oh, no! Um, Ilsa. And, um... Rodrigo. Ilsa and Rodrigo. Yeah. I love Ilsa and Rodrigo. Yeah, me too. Okay, so Ilsa and Rodrigo are now on opposite sides of this war. They were good neighbors for a long time, mm -hmm. it sounds like. Um, so how old are they, do we think? Um, they're different ages. Uh... Ilsa is older, I mm. think. She is maybe in her 70s. Mm -hmm. uh, Rodrigo is like 30. Gotcha. Um, so in order to tie them directly to the conflict, what if Rodrigo is in his side's army now? Mm. See what I mean? Mm -hmm. He's in his side's army and he's at the border, which means that he's at a good place to strike, mm -hmm. right? Um, and let's say one day he gets an assignment uh, to sort of like invade over the other side and like take over a certain address and he realizes that it's Ilsa's address. I think he like owes her something from before yeah. this all started. Mm -hmm. She did something for him. Right. That makes sense. Um, yeah, what? Uh, I don't know. She gave him something. Right. Uh, something that he really needed. Something that he really needed. Something that we can get a call back to when he goes into yeah. her house. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's interesting. I like that. And one of the things I like about this is that instead of needing to figure out, instead of our heroes being the, like, major commanders of this war, mm -hmm. right, and dealing with this, like, really abstract concept, we are reducing the war down to a conflict that we can understand and have an emotional investment mm -hmm. in, which is just these two people that it sounds like have been friendly to one another mm -hmm. and have been there for one another for a long time mm -hmm. and are suddenly forced to not be. Yeah. Right? Um, how's it work out for Ilsen Rodrigo? Um, I, I think okay, actually. Yeah. Um, I think they may 
it's possible I may need to somehow exit the situation. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if it's going to be possible for them to, like, resolve the war just between the two of them. Right. Um, right. Rodrigo defects and helps Ilsa escape. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I totally have faith in them. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. I think they make it out. Yeah. Good old Ilsa and Rodrigo. Let's... Uh... I'm emotionally invested <laughs> big time actually one of the things that's really nice about this exercise is that like uh, we don't we don't know nothing about Elsa and Rodrigo right yeah. but the fact that we've kind of set up this relationship so that there is something inherently in the way of mm-hmm. them being okay mm-hmm. kind of makes us want them to be okay more right because it's harder for us to have right um then we see some examples oh we just we just got a big one yeah we got a lot Um, okay. Uh, Min Max Munchkin. Helen and George live on opposite sides of an online clash in a guild war. That is very clever. I like that. The setting is a post-apocalyptic world where life is really boring with no real need to do jobs, so most of life is spent online. The purpose of the tangible world is just means to keep living in this, uh, in this, in this real world. Despite the fact that Helen and George are actually in love, they are rivals online, and constantly feel pressured to actually maintain image, but how much will it hurt and be true? They had been close friends in childhood, but soon they became the figureheads of social grounds in a fictional world as the guild leaders, but in the real world they do not know much to let that online relationship define them in the present real world. Should virtual hate leak into their real world that they live in? I like that a lot. That's interesting. I'm rooting for him, and I don't know nothing about him, but I'm rooting for him. Um, yeah, and I think that was just, like, a very clever way to take on, like, the, to how to make the war idea work, but also the neighbors yeah. idea work. I like That's it. That's very clever. Um. Let's get one more, since that one was a little bit long and we're running low on time. Okay. Um. How about. Oh, I like this. Uh, Faintly Macabre. (laughs) Uh, Marina is a spy and is unexpectedly devastated when her neighbor, Rue, tells her that she's enlisted in the army. They've had a good relationship up to this point. When Rue bakes, she'll bring something over for for Marina. And when Rue's washing machine breaks down, she can count on Marina to fix it up again. Rue ships off and Marina thinks she'll never see her again, but then Marina gets pulled for the front lines. (sighs) Yeah, that's rough. That's very good. Right. And the relationship yeah. assists the conflict, right? I love that. I like it a lot. Um, so, uh, those are our three tips for interesting relationships. Like like I said, there are a bunch of other things that you can do. Um, for this week's You're Stuck at Home, so you might as well do this work. Um, I'm going to recommend continue playing the game we just played with your small group, use random numbers to generate a relationship, and then write a dialogue or discuss how you develop it. One way I've done this with my classes before is if you do this with one other person, each person takes a character, um, and you each are rep- responsible for one character's dialogue. Cool. Um, and then watch a movie with a relationship at, the core, uh, at its core with your group. Discuss where the relationship starts and ends, then point out shortcut moments that got it there. In other words, literally how we watch movies. Yes, absolutely. Be <laughs> intolerable while you watch a movie. Yeah. That's your homework. <laughs> um, in a minute, we're going to go to questions. I think we can run over a little bit today. Is that okay yeah, I think we have before. Um, so we're going to take a quick break while you all come up with questions and put them in the, uh, in the Discord, okay? And we'll be right back. Thanks, everybody.
Hi, everybody. We're Hello. back, and we're bigger than ever. Are uh, we? Well, we, before we were little on the corners. So. Oh, this is great. Now I can just look at myself. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. I... Stuck with me? Stuck with me. You are stuck with me. We had a very good question uh, from Ace, which says, what pieces of fiction do you find particularly compelling relationships in? Um, and I've, I've got to tell you, Ace, right now I find uh, this friendship <laughs> not very compelling at all. Um, would like to opt out. <laughs> you can't. <laughs> I can't, and I, I, I wouldn't. So, what stories do we find compelling relationships in? Oh, uh, one of my favorites is um, The Time Traveler's Wife. Oh, God, yes. If you've read it, if you have not read it, I mm -hmm. strongly recommend. Uh, it is a huge bummer. It's <laughs> so beautiful. But that is definitely one where, like, character and plot and relationship are kind of all baked into this endless loop yeah. uh, because of the time travel aspect. Mm -hmm. um, and it is about uh, a man who time travels, but it's, um, they describe it kind of like epilepsy, like it just happens to him sometimes. Yeah. Uh, and one of, but one of the things he keeps returning to is uh, like his wife's childhood. So like he meets her, over and over again when she's a child, like, as she's growing up, which means that for her, she's known him her whole life when he's an adult coming back to visit her. Mm -hmm. um, it is a beautiful story. It is incredibly sad. Um, and, like, they, their relationship is so affected by this time loop right. um, and knowing each other at different ages and having affected each other in that way. Right. Um, so... Right. That's one of my favorites. Um, if you're looking for a suggestion for something to watch with your group, uh, for uh, with like something with a really interesting set of relationships, um, the talented Mr. Ripley is the, mm. is the greatest movie ever made. Uh, That's kind of true. Yeah, we could have stopped making movies after that movie. I feel, um, but it's unbelievable. I actually can't spoil for you what the central relationship is, um, but that movie is a really, really interesting take on tying your conflict to uh tying your con <laughs> that's a good question tying your conflicts to uh to the character development right because all of the conflicts are so character centric um we have another good question up there um yeah very very briefly while sophie grabs one mm -hmm. uh fumiki asks is mick mercury based on larry butts from ace attorney and the answer is yes now we can keep moving mm -hmm. yes <laughs> One thousand percent. Yeah. Um, I, we've talked about this a little bit before, but we could talk about it. Uh, yeah, go for it. Uh, Shriya Zazim asks, any advice for naturally developing a polyamorous relationship? Um, obviously, there's a lot of different types of polyamorous relationships. And again, if you are a listener of the show, you'll know that the only type that we've actually thoroughly addressed on the show is um, like a, a triad where all three people are in the same relationship. And of course, there are a lot of different ways it could go, right? It could be like a V where one person is in a relationship with two different people and those two aren't in a relationship with each other. Um, in our case, we chose a triad. And in that case, what we found very important was giving each set of characters a chance to uh, develop their own dynamic. Right. Um, if you'll notice, each line on the triangle that connects the three of them has its own built-in conflict. So they right. all stay engaging. Right. So, like, and, and it, it means that it's really, we at least found it worthwhile to, like, devote time and space to each one of those connections. You know, like, make sure there are scenes and arcs for, for each of those. Um, and that gives you a lot more to go on when you look at that fourth relationship which is between oh, all three of them, mm -hmm. which is going to have its own dynamic. Um, and, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what else. I mean, I, I think it, it just helps to have that established baseline piece of what do each two look like mm -hmm. when they're together. Um, yeah. 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 I mean, it's... That's it's, my advice. Yeah, it's just, it's exponentially more complicated than a relationship between two people. Yeah, and it takes a lot more time and mm -hmm. space, uh, both in real life and in fiction. And Yeah, we had to dedicate two years to it. Yeah. Just to even make it, even, yeah. even shortcutting like crazy, we had to dedicate two years in order to make it right. plausible. 
Right. Especially because we have so much else going on in the show. Mm -hmm. uh, but I would say again there that you might find it helpful to find shortcuts mm -hmm. um, in order to make that happen. Otherwise, it's just going to like get bigger and bigger. Mm -hmm. um, I see a question that I really like by Deifier today. Mm -hmm. I think that's how you pronounce it. Uh, ever tried for a particular relationship mm -hmm. or relationship dynamic in a story and had it not work? What did you do? My general suggestion for anything like that, if you start outlining something and then when you write it, it just doesn't work, look at the thing that it keeps turning into and ask yourself if that is secretly better. Because uh, a lot of the time, what's happened is that you've you've outgrown the outline, right? Um, so you need to find, uh, you need to ask yourself, what are the pros of this situation? I want these two characters to fall in love, but uh, once they're in love, they keep on like breaking up and just being friends, right? Uh, maybe that's the best solution for those characters. Maybe what you're writing isn't a love story like you thought it was, um, or a romantic love story anyway. Uh, try to keep updated to what your story has become instead of what you would like it to be. Because sometimes the story it becomes is way better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Olive asks, can you have a sappy established relationship with no conflicts, but still create tension for them and conflicts in the background to keep people invested? Um, so, well, first of all, I don't think you can have a relationship with no conflicts. Right. That, uh, those don't exist. Right. Uh, but I take your meaning. Like, you know, you're, you're asking if the point is not that the relationship has conflicts. And yes, of course you can. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I don't know if people watch this anymore, but um, one example I really like of that is Friday Night Lights, actually. Mm. Um, I've still never seen it. Yeah, it's a it's a TV show and it's about football, which is weird for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's like the only time I've ever been invested in the sport. Uh, but it, it's because it's a really really well written show with some really great characters. Um, and two of the main characters are the coach and uh, Coach Taylor and his wife. Um, and they're very like relationship goals. They have um, a really strong relationship. The plot is not really ever about them falling apart or fighting or anything like that. Um, but they are a main established relationship and stuff happens around them. Mm -hmm. um, and of course they come into conflict with each other. They fight all that stuff, but that is not the arc of the show. It's not their relationship getting together or falling apart. So you absolutely can do that. Um, you know, just know that like there are no two people real and fictional, real or for fictional who like realistically can just go along and never fight. Yeah. And even, um, even if it's not fighting, you know, like uh, certain conflicts can be things like you, one of them really worries about the other one. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I, I have, like, I have plenty of friends that I've never had an argument with, but who I think about a lot and I hope they're doing okay. And that um, that by itself can be enough of a conflict to hook you. Right. Right. Yes, that's a good point. Conflict doesn't have to mean fighting. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and and like also sometimes things happen to a relationship that can put strain on it. That's not necessarily interpersonal. Mm -hmm. You know, someone loses their job. Um, we have time for a couple more, I think. Okay. Um... This is interesting. Have we ever done that? I don't know if we really have. I don't know. Um, let's let's come back to that one, maybe. Do you want to do that one? Searching, we're searching. It's an interesting question, yeah. Uh, Aaron slash Key says, uh, how do you tell when a relationship arc has been resolved? Yeah, it kind of coming off of uh, Unionize the Rats, who says, how do you decide when two dating or more characters' relationship has ended? Interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, one thing that's worth thinking about, and then we can get into more concrete uh, things for this, is that uh, when we've been talking about this, we've been talking about you may have noticed that all the examples that we've pulled have been very, you know, big broad stroke stories in which the relationship is the point, right? Um, Beauty and the Beast is about beauty and, and a beast. <laughs> uh, and, and so on, right? Um, uh, for examples from our show, we've mostly pulled out, like, episodes where romantic relationships are, are developed, right? right. Um, 
the thing is, if you're writing something where the relationships are more in the background, mm -hmm. um, the question of when does a relationship arc end is a little hard to say because very often you have multiple arcs running at the same time. Right. Right. Oh, um, actually, maybe a really good example of that, again, assuming people are caught up, is Juno and Rita. Mm -hmm. uh, because we had an arc that ended a lot sooner mm -hmm. than we originally planned for it to. Yes, that's true. And we ended up just letting it be. Yeah. Um, we had a... Actually, let's not talk about it in too specific terms. Yeah, we, we can. We can be cryptic about it. But we had an idea for a big twist that would happen in season three of our show regarding Juno and Rita that organically it just kind of happened between them at the end of season two yeah um so it didn't make sense to bother with it in season three anymore because their relationship had developed that central conflict had just kind of ended right um i think you just need to like you need to be able to i guess crystallize like what is the meat of that conflict mm -hmm. and then you can ask yourself okay well have we actually already addressed that right you know like what what is the thing that puts them into contention so in this case um and i think this is in no way a spoiler but like in this case the real point of conflict between juno and rita for a long time was that he didn't really take her or her, her emotions seriously mm -hmm. you know and he was not thoughtful about uh, what he was putting her through all the time. You know, he would just, like, disappear and not explain anything about it. And she's sort of his best friend. And she was just kind of left to pick up the pieces all the time. Um, so that was the meat of their conflict. And then by the time we kind of got to... I don't know, I guess it was, like, Long Way Home. Mm -hmm. I think it was Long Way Home. We were like, oh you know what, this can't be the basis for, like, a whole arc in season three because yeah. they've addressed it, right? They've, like, talked through it, he's apologized, and he's clearly um, change, starting to figure out how to change his behavior. Mm -hmm. um, so there's kind of no point. So right. because we knew what the meat of conflict was supposed to be, we could ask ourselves, wait, have we already kind of addressed that? Mm -hmm. And again, addressing doesn't always necessarily mean resolving, fixing, tying it up with a bow, but, like... It's been addressed. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, then maybe we have time for, like, one more. Okay. Pick a good one, Kaner. Uh, it's easy. They're all, it's easy. They're all really good. Uh, um, I, I want to do that one, but I don't really understand it. <laughs> um, oh. That's a really interesting question. I don't have an immediate answer, but how do you feel about talking it out? Yeah, let's talk okay. it out. So Cecil asks, in terms of difference in relationships, would you say there are any major differences in how you write relationships that are immediately romantic versus ones that become romantic as the story moves forward? That's cool. Um, I think this is a case where, to go back to some of our unteachables from the beginning of this, um, pulling from my own life has been really useful uh, because the thing is that a relationship that's by a relationship that's immediately romantic I guess I'm assuming that you mean like two people start dating uh, so like the the intent is clear right we are we are going to engage in the romance um, I think it's we can say that like Juno and Nureyev is an immediately romantic right. relationship because even though they're not dating from the beginning, like we kind of know. Right. I I think that, but I think that like the individual motions that happen with the relationship, mm -hmm. even if it's you know immediately romantic, that does not get rid of most of the the conflicts inherent in having just met somebody, mm -hmm. right? Um, you don't know anything about them. You have assumptions about them that it turns out aren't true. Uh, you are planning for something and it turns out they don't like it, right? Uh, tons of things like that that are still the case. I mean, I would say actually that like relationships that are, that are immediately romantic, I think are inherently a shortcut yeah. of fiction. Yeah. You know, like love at first sight is a fictional shortcut. Yeah. That is not a real thing. <laughs> Just to be clear. Uh, you know, physical attraction at first sight is certainly a thing, but love at first sight is not a thing because love is a thing that develops over a long time. Right. Um, crush, so, at, crush at first sight. 
Makes sense. Yeah, maybe. At sight? I've had that before. All right. Yeah. Um, but, so, so I think that's kind of already a shortcut that we're kind of accustomed to yeah. in fiction. Um, I mean, in terms of writing, like, relationships that are immediately romantic, I think it is, it's like a filter you put on, right? So it's mm-hmm. like, that is, if they're immediately romantic, then whatever your point of view is, you are describing that character in a romantic way, right? Mm-hmm. So you think about uh, Juno's first description of, well, Rex Glass, actually. Yeah. Um, and, you know, he looked like he, what is it? He'd be happy to kill me. Right, he, was it, he'd be happy to kiss me? Yeah, kiss, kiss me or kill me. me. Yeah. yeah, it wasn't a bad look, all things considered. And so it's right. like, it's not a neutral description right. that is being given. It is a description with a very clear romantic filter on it. Right. A lot of this and a lot of the answers to a lot of these questions also come down to individual style. Like one thing that people really, really like to point out about their show, and they're 100% right, is that in the first two storylines, uh, Juno is really, really intense about his attractions to people. Right. Like really intense. And part of that is because I think we're most comfortable in a very heightened, exaggerated style. Mm -hmm. So for us, you know, asking the audience to give you the gimme of, uh, they just just were attracted to each other when they saw each other. And they're confident about it. Go, right? (laughs) Um, You can do that. Um, Yeah. Um, So yeah, in in terms of how you write it, I think you want to, like, again, this... There are so many variables here, so it does depend on, like, if this is first person, is this is third person, is it a play, is it a short yeah. story, whatever. Um, but, like, no matter whose point of view it is, think about the filter, you know? Like, because we all have that, right? You you view your friend through one filter, and you view your uh, romantic interest or your partner through another filter, mm-hmm. and you would describe them differently for that reason yeah. and um so then if you have characters who their relationship is platonic at first they're going to be describing each other or thinking of each other through one filter and then one way that we're going to discover that it's becoming romantic is that that filter is going to change right um one thing that you may also be picking up on about those filters is that you know it also just depends on your worldview and your assumptions about the way people work mm-hmm. right you can tell that Sophie and I very you vehemently do not believe in the idea of love at first sight uh, because we you know we've 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 had conversations about uh, th- that it needs to happen through development right you may not be a person who agrees with us your worldview might even center around that idea in which case the way that you write characters mm-hmm. is going to come across different that's true um, so a lot of it is really just observing the world around you, coming to your own conclusions about it, trying to be as honest with yourself as possible, and then showing that as best you can. I think we've gone quite a bit over now, so I think that should be our Oh, point. Joshua's in the chat. That's what's happening. Yep. I see. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Um, uh, yeah, I think that's our time for today. Yeah. So remember, Good stuff, y'all. Yeah. No, uh, the participation today was real, real good and like really well thought out. Yeah. So and I, I really, I, I will go back and read through uh, the things that people, uh, the ideas that people put down because I was I'm really liking what I saw. Cool. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Have so a... make sure you do your group work. Yep. Do your group work. I am super excited to see what you all come up with and again next week we'll pick a submission and we'll read it at the beginning right for your i can't wait for for your submissions in the submit channel i would specifically ask you to uh i gave so i gave you the the two pieces of not homework which Mm. was uh number one uh to continue playing that game with your group and uh to like watch a movie discuss with your group uh try to keep your submissions to number one uh, just because if we also include number two, it's going, if, if you talk about a movie that we've never seen before, then uh, we might think you made it up or it'll just be, it'll just be pretty confusing to sort through those two. So try to keep it to, uh, results you got playing that game and feel free to make up your own relationships and conflicts too. If you come with something interesting. Yeah. I can't wait to see. Um, yeah. and again, uh, if you decide you, um, are able to do this, we left the link in the description as far as, um, supporting, the what's the name of the group name of the group is 
uh, the emergency release fund. Mm -hmm. So if that's something that you're interested in doing, we would really appreciate it if you decide to contribute. Um, and I think that's it. I think so. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. And this we, is always a wonderful time. Yes, this is the best. And we will see you again mm -hmm. next Saturday at 2. Yes, we'll see you there. Bye.